While it's usually the low point of a performance review at work, fighting a boss tends to be a high point in video games. After overcoming an enemy's minions, dodging their traps, and tracking them to their lair, you finally get a chance to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with them in a climactic battle of wits, strength, and resolve. Unfortunately, sometimes it turns out that someone forgot to tell that to the boss, who will resort to the weirdest, cheapest, or most fourth-wall-breaking tactics they can think of in an attempt to sneak out a victory. Here are seven times we had to put up with just that. Enjoy and beware spoilers ahead for the following games. Having an audience can be a daunting prospect. It's Especially if you get stage fright. Boo! Oh, this oh, is going oh no! Oh, oh, oh no! There are no such concerns, however, for Mario in the GameCube classic Paper Mario The Thousand Year Door, in which every battle takes place in front of a cheering audience that presumably he had bust in to make himself look more popular. This audience serves a practical purpose beyond just boosting Mario's ego, however. They also help out, refilling Mario's star power, throwing useful items onto the stage, and attacking the enemy, something that will usually get you thrown out of most theatres. I'm told. Look, no one else was going to stop Aaron Burr, he was going to shoot Hamilton! Anyway, the point is, the audience in Paper Mario gives Mario a big advantage over his opponents, which is why the game's first major boss, a papercraft dragon named Hooktail, is such a jerk for trying to mess with that advantage. Hooktail has already proven that they're not above underhanded tactics by trying to sucker you mid-fight, with fake bribes that range from the tempting... to the baffling. I'm... I'm good, thanks. But it's at this point that Hooktail really breaks the rules by gobbling up half the audience, restoring their hit points and robbing you of your allies in one fell swoop. Mario prevails thanks to the tried and trusted technique of hitting Hooktail with a big hammer, but now will forever have to carry the psychological scars of Hooktail's monstrous actions. I mean, eating raw mushrooms, honestly. At least saute them with a bit of garlic or something. Check it, man. Muska is actually coming to this dump for a skate demo. Get dressed, let's go. 2003's Tony Hawk's Underground is a taut rumination on friendship, betrayal, and the corrupting nature of power that is easily the equivalent of anything Shakespeare ever wrote. It's your old school on the phone, Jane. They want to revoke your English A level. Tell them I'm busy. In it, you play as an unnamed amateur skater who dreams of making it big and is inexplicably friends with a guy named Eric Sparrow, who is the worst person alive. Well, I just got my ride all set up. Sort of. Looks like that thing's held together with duct tape. Let's go skate. Over the course of the game, Eric attempts to sabotage your pro skating career at every turn, almost has you killed by drug dealers, causes $700,000 worth of damages in a stolen tank in Russia, and sticks you with the blame, and worst of all, steals a videotape of you doing a trick that is only a trick and not a horrendous tragedy that would kill you and dozens of innocent people because you managed to land it. By the end of the game, Eric's Machiavellian skateboard scheming has paid off, and as you can see, he's handling fame well. We just raised my demo rate to 5 Gs. I need five in my hand or I won't skate. I don't care how many kids are waiting. Nice guy. That's when Eric offers you a challenge, a race around your old neighborhood. Winner gets to keep the star-making tape of you breaking about 40 laws in the pursuit of skateboarding glory. That's easy, you might think. I'm twice the skateboarding guy that this Eric Sparrow is. This boss battle is gonna be easy. Unless, I mean, Eric would have to keep dropping firebombs or something in my path. 
And honestly, who would do that? Worst person alive, remember? Ah, uh, Eric. This is the last straw. I mean, the trying to get us killed, and the theft, and the sabotage, and the almost having us arrested in Russia were bad, but this, this is my line in the sand. Anyway, this turns an already incredibly difficult follow the leader sequence into a nigh on impossible chase scene. As you try to nail Eric's mind bendingly difficult line and dodge the plumes of flame that he is somehow magicking out of thin air like some kind of extreme wizard. Finish it though and you get your tape back, achieve the skating glory that is rightfully yours and unlock the opportunity to see the secret ending in which Eric offers to race you for the tape and you knock him out with a single punch. Ouch. Hey, hey, what do you say? One last trip around the neighborhood. Winner takes the tape. I mean, I say you knock him out, but oh, who cares? It's Eric Sparrow. F that guy. Monster, you don't belong in this world! It was not by my hand that I'm once again given flesh. I was called here by humans who wish to pay me tribute. I Wanna Be The Guy, or to give it its full title, I Wanna Be The Guy, The Movie, The Game, is a unique PC game that tells the story of a kid who wants to become a guy and fears wildly between simple fruit collecting platforming and massive, massive copyright infringement. By this, he presumably means a cease and desist letter from Nintendo's lawyers. The game is also comically, laughably unfair throughout, but nowhere is this more galling than in the boss fight against Dracula, who it seems is taking some downtime between Castlevania games. Tribute? You steal men's souls and make them your slaves! Perhaps the same could be said of all religions. Dracula is already a tough boss, subjecting you to bullet hell style waves of fruit, teleporting, throwing the moon at you, and unforgivably stealing art assets from Mario games. His most underhanded tactic, however, occurs in the introductory chat between Dracula and your character, where, mid sentence, he will casually chuck a wine glass at you that will kill you if it touches you. Your words are as empty as your soul. Mankind ill needs a savior such as you. What is a man? Oh, what? We weren't ready. I thought we'd call each other foul fiends a few more times. To be fair, this is probably our fault for trusting Dracula. <laughs> Bravely Second is a somewhat impenetrable Japanese RPG that you should nonetheless be aware of, if only for the fact that its more than 30 character classes include both Catmancer and Patissiere a class whose offensive capabilities should not be underestimated. Ow! See? It also features a final boss called Providence, a sort of floating magpie monster who feeds on despair and is accordingly a veritable greatest hits collection of uncool, unfair boss tactics. You are stolen for insects. But your resistance means nothing. Himself, turning party members against you, casting unblockable party killing spells if you don't stop him in time, these jerk tactics are meat and drink to Providence. But get him down to 50% health for a second time and you'll realise that when Providence says he feeds on despair, he means it. That's because he knows exactly where to strike at a gamer who has sunk hundreds of hours into a dense JRPG, their save file. Whoa, 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 Providence, steady on, man. You do what you like to our party. We don't even like half those guys. But don't you dare touch our save files. Don't give up. Thankfully, it turns out this whole thing is just an illusion. But if you were aiming for despair, Providence, you got it. I nearly lost everything. 
And how am I meant to defeat him now without my battle croissant? Ow! Thank you. Impressive, Batman. I doubted you would actually return. I'm a man of my word, Victor. You should know that by now. In theory, beating Batman villain Mr. Freeze should be easy. You just turn on a radiator, or make a pun about something cold, and then arrest him while he lies on the floor helplessly convulsed with laughter. All right, everyone, chill. Sadly, that's not the case with the Mr. Freeze in Rocksteady's Batman Arkham City, who is a lot more serious than his predecessors and fails to crack a smile at any of my excellent ice puns. Hey, Freeze, what's with the frosty reception? I can't believe my ice. Uh, if you're hungry, you should just have lunch. Man, I'm dying out here, and this is my A material. The point is, this freeze is a force to be reckoned with, as you'll discover when you face him down in his lab in Arkham City, where he resorts to one of the cheapest tactics we've ever seen a video game boss employ. Learning from his mistakes. That is the last time that will work on me. Cheesing a boss through repeated use of cheap tactics is a proud video game tradition, which is why it was such a shock to discover that once you'd identified a winning strategy against your frosty foe, he would learn from it and close down that avenue of attack for good. I'm all my strategies and you. What are we supposed to do? Work hard, adapt and improvise? <laughs> we are? Why was I not informed about this in advance? That will not happen again. Inconvenience aside, this is what makes Freeze's boss fight so great. But after years of bad habits, this felt like a real rug pull from a guy who we have to admit really froze to the occasion. Oh, ho, ho, ho. was that a little smile there? All right, back to the writer's room. Boo! Eek! Hello, Guybrush. Hello, Lechuck. You won't escape me this time. I escaped from you before, I can easily do it again. Not so fast. We don't need to get into the reasons as to why at the end of Monkey Island 2 you're in the tunnels underneath an amusement park frantically trying to assemble a voodoo doll so you can kill a dead pirate. I mean, you can probably figure it out for yourself, right? Say, that wouldn't happen to be a voodoo doll, would it? Why, yes, as a matter of fact, it is a voodoo doll, which I'll be using to torture you and then send you screaming to another dimension, one of infinite pain. The main thing is that's the situation you do find yourself in during the game's final boss battle against the zombie pirate LeChuck, a limping, drooling revenant who it has just been revealed is your brother and who also wants to kill you. No, no, that's not true, that's impossible. Point and click adventures aren't particularly known for their memorable boss battles, but Monkey Island 2 is one of the few that is, mostly thanks to LeChuck's incredibly underhanded tactics. See, LeChuck has a voodoo doll of you, which is supposed to send you screaming to a dimension of infinite pain, but in actual fact, only ends up sending you screaming into the next room. Okay, time to send you screaming to a dimension of infinite pain. At last, I'm rid of that pesky little wimp Guybrush. Ah, hey, I'm alive. Hey? I thought I was a goner. What follows is a race against the clock as you attempt to cobble together a makeshift voodoo doll only to be interrupted every 30 seconds by LeChuck hobbling into the room and teleporting you somewhere random like an absolute jerk. And as anyone who's ever tried to use an ATM with a hangover can tell you, the only thing harder than trying to figure out something complicated is trying to do it on a time limit. Uh, LeChuck, will you just give me five seconds? I'm never going to assemble this voodoo doll and defeat you at this rate. Okay, done. Oh, wait, this is Mike. All right, back to the drawing board. Ow, I fell. They say you don't get a second chance to make a first impression, which is a shame. As the first time we see Bloodborne boss Father Gascoigne, he's hacking away at a bunch of corpses in a cemetery and looks like he spent the last 400 nights sleeping in a morgue dumpster. Beasts all over the shop. You'll be one of them sooner or later. 
It's nice to meet you too. Anyway, there's no coming back from that and as with all socially awkward situations, you're left with no choice but to challenge them to a duel, a prospect that seems pretty fair considering that you're both hunters and are similarly armed with hunter's weapons and firearms. Father Gascoigne does have one little trick up his sleeve that isn't available to you, however. The ability to turn into a terrifying, hulking beast form who can smash through everything, is incredibly resistant to damage, and more powerful than the ending of Paddington. The family needed the bear as much as the bear needed the family. Call me old-fashioned, but it seems to me that in a fair fight, neither competitor should be allowed to transform into an unreasonably powerful monster and trash everything. What do you say, father? Interesting counterpoint. We'll call it a draw. Man, can you believe all those bosses? What a bunch of absolute cheats. Tell you what, I'm gonna get the bad taste of their cheating tactics out of my mouth with some more videos. So up here is one from us, which is about fighting game characters who were so weird or bad or had an owl head that they weren't invited back for another game. So that's good, check that out from us. And down here is a video from Outside Extra, which is about stealth takedowns that were really noisy, sort of defeating the point of stealth takedowns. Uh, thanks for watching. I can't say takedowns.